Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock-solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is going to come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am excited to be here with my friend, Andrea Hamilton. We know each other in person. It's been a long time since we've seen each other, but we took a songwriting class together a long time ago. So um, I'm excited to have her on the show. I had her on the Female Entrepreneur Musician man, man, like five, six years ago. And I'm really excited to have her back because we're going to talk about something that I guess is a little bit niche, but honestly, in, in my audience, there are a ton of people that are working at churches, working as worship leaders, um, you know, all across the board denominations or non-denominational or, you know, even universalist. like there's a ton of people that that are in my audience that do this. And so I thought it would be really important to have this conversation, especially because I am also a worship director at a church and having to learn how to manage time about, we were talking earlier about boundaries, trying to manage, you know, how, how you do what, when, and not take on too many things. So we're going to get into that. Um, But first I would love for you, Andrea, to just let people know about kind of your background, your story, and you can even talk about, you know, how we met and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on. I feel really honored because this is a podcast I actually listen to and glean a lot of wisdom from. So I'm excited to be on an episode. But yeah, as Bree said, my name's Andrea Hamilton, and I am a songwriter, top liner and producer. I do pop music, and I also do worship and gospel music. And as she mentioned, I also worked at a church on a church staff for 10 years. So recently transitioned off of that. And we have a lot to talk about and geek out about with that. But I've been writing for the sync world and this past four years, focusing more on top lining for EDM and yeah, toured a little bit, did a lot of random things. Now I produce for other artists as well, teach a little bit of few lessons here and there and it all comes together. Yeah, you are like the true example of the whole like many pieces of the pie come together for the uh, income streams because I didn't even realize you were producing people. Do you have a home studio? Yeah, I do have a home studio, but I usually farm out my like drum tracking. Uh, I can't really do that here. (laughs) Yeah, so. And then top lining, that's cool. Are there any particular places that you get those gigs from? So the top lining thing was really interesting for me in 2018, which was the height of the evolution of Spotify playlisting, like um, labels were having lots of conversations with Spotify about optimizing playlisting. At that time, I was doing YouTube covers for fun. Um, Like once a month, I'd pick a song that came out that day. Well, in 2018, Happier by Bastille and Marshmallow came out. Mm -hmm. And I covered it the same day it dropped. And then that night, a uh, well-known, although I had never heard of him yet, EDM producer from Germany saw my cover and emailed me, hey, like, can I have your vocal? Can I remix this? I didn't know who he was. I thought he was some kid with a laptop. And I said, sure, 
I sent him my vocal tuned, untuned. I sent him the MIDI. I had lip synced it. So I had like the whole logic track, you know, so I mm -hmm. sent it to him. It was to a click and he was like, what? Thanks. You know, and I'm like, yeah, sure. Have fun. Well, he created a really cool remix and then a label picked it up. And then um, that was my first EDM top line situation. So the label that released it got, you know, got it on a playlist and it, it blew up. It had millions of streams, um, which is the first time that's ever happened in my life for me. And after that, I started getting asked to top line by a lot of international EDM producers at different levels in their careers. And I just said yes to as much as possible. My rule of thumb was like, if their Spotify has more monthly than monthly listeners than mine does, then I should collaborate with them. And that's how the original EDM stuff started happening. So that was like 2019, 2020, I was kind of top lining a lot of more EDM stuff. So different genre for me, a little bit of a learning curve with the writing style, but um, that's, that's how I've gotten my Spotify listenership is those collaborations because the labels that those songs end up on have much better means to put the song on Spotify in ways that'll get heard. So my indie, my indie stuff, it still doesn't get heard like those EDM top line songs do. I mean, it gets a little boost just from crossover fans, but yeah. No, that's really smart. Actually, I did an episode with Cassandra Kabinsky really early on in the Profitable Musician show talking about the specific thing of she was using basically those kinds of partnerships to boost her own Spotify. Yeah. And Collaborations really is smart. huge. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. And I mean, I've never, I've done lots of gig stuff, but it's usually never stuff that I'd want to put on my own Spotify. It's very like niche you know, things that are even like for ads and stuff like that, right. and like things that I would <laughs> never want to oh, yeah. associate. I with have a own. lot of those too. work for hire stuff that I have yeah. to make them sign a thing that they won't put my name on it mm -hmm. <laughs> because a it's too political or B it's for an advertisement for something embarrassing or <laughs> yeah. oh my God. totally. I've done so many ones that are political mm -hmm. and I'm always like, should I let him put my name out there or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Scary. <laughs> Yeah, it is scary on either side either, because it's like, you know, your audience is all, my audience is all over the place. So if I were to do something, you know, that was more conservative, that might upset some of the other people and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it probably is a good, a good idea to keep your name out of it, but still take the work, right? Yes, I, I as long as this song or whatever isn't saying or doing anything that I think is harmful, I mean, mm -hmm. I would certainly say no to those things, but um but do I have to agree with every premise of every um, nonprofit or company that I work with? No, all these labels, I would, there's so much corruption and stuff. Like I, I would, I wouldn't be working with anyone if I stood on principle completely all the time. So it's a hard, it's a hard line to walk. <laughs> like, yeah, but I mean, we, we did one recently that was just like, go out and vote and care about democracy. And I was like, yes, I can sing that. That's okay. I just did one just like that. That's so oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> It was all about going, getting people to vote. Yeah. So that's nothing that's, wrong with that. No, nothing wrong with that. No, it's, it's, it's a good thing, I think. Um, but not, not anything I really want to associate with my artist persona necessarily. Yeah. And then just for me in particular, I, I don't identify super strongly with either team. I'm kind of a person who understands a lot of the nuance in the conversations on these different topics. And I, I don't agree completely with either side. So and then my my nonprofit work is in the anti trafficking arena, mm. which is nonpartisan pretty much. So I don't want to alienate anyone, and I don't want to detract from my main um, area of you know compassion and care, which is like stopping trafficking in our our nation. So yeah, I love that. So do you um, with that particular cause? Do you? align that with your your artist brand are you doing you know shows where you're raising money for that or anything yes i have and i do have merch at my shows that has um to do with two anti-trafficking nonprofits that i'm an ambassador for so one of them's the u.s institute against human trafficking which is actually who i'm like i volunteer with them so i do trainings and i speak at different you know like first responder gatherings and things about um, you know, trainings for like how to spot trafficking and how to stop it and how to be, you can become like a trafficking free zone and things like that. 
So I bring some of their stuff, just informational stuff. And then there's a nonprofit called Project AK-47, which um, rescues child soldiers around the world. And they have like these cool little like name tag things and all this kind of merch to get the word out about them. So I bring that to a lot of shows too. I love that. And that's so great. And I, I love aligning with the cause. I think it's, I mean, obviously we want to help get the word out, but it also just kind of, it's just like rallies people around, around you and your cause. And I, so I, I think that's really great that you're doing that. Uh, and then I wanted to talk, we're going to talk a bunch about churches in a minute, but I, I wanted to talk also about your entrepreneurial stuff that you're doing now that you said you kind of been moving into in the last few years. Yeah. So there was a transition. I resigned at the church. I was part-time there at the time. So I had already been kind of transitioning and thinking about it. And then there had just been a lot of change, of course. And um, the the whole leadership team was completely different than when I had started working there 10 years prior, because that's how most churches right. have a lot of change and evolution. And I didn't feel I was as good of a fit. I didn't feel like I was serving them and their vision. I don't feel like we had the same priorities about artistry and style. Mm. So thankfully, it wasn't anything super, I don't know, important. It was just kind of creative differences. But to me, that is important. And I don't like working with people who don't think the same as me creatively and artistically. So I eventually did have to find a way to, to move out of that. So there was a season in like 2021 and 2022 where I was I knew I was going to have to transition off staff there at some point where I was building up my other income. So to me, that looked like teaching more lessons. Um, I had been telling people no, you know, that mm -hmm. I didn't have time to teach lessons. And so I just had reconnected with all those people. And there was someone who had just quit teaching in my area. So I just basically got all her students and that worked out so great. That was a blessing. And then I also started producing people's podcasts for them. This is before I even had my own podcast. <laughs> so, but um, I have a, a lot of experience in, in audio production in general. So it was just a matter of learning the distribution knowledge for podcasts. And um, yeah, so that helped me get my income to a point where I could transition off of the church staff. And then I didn't know what Sundays would look like. And for a while they were really random. I was grateful to be singing somewhere most Sundays because that was part of the income pie too. And mm. it's something I love to do so much. I got to see a lot of different communities, a lot of different churches with different songs, different styles, learned a ton of new music, but it was a little bit random for like that first year, just being somewhere different every Sunday. And then eventually I got um, invited to contract. Um, so most Sundays now I'm at one church, which is really nice. I kind of get to know people and, you know, streamline some of the things. So. So you're not on staff, but you're like a contracted person that comes in every Sunday. Yeah. And that's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's been really fun. That's awesome. I'm curious because I, I really struggle with finding subs for myself when I want to go on vacation. How did you find all those churches when you were, you know, transitioning out? Like, where did you put your information or did you just kind of like network with people? It was people I knew previously, all except for one. So there was one church in Long Beach who was between worship pastors and they wanted me to be there like once a month and that was perfect. So um, it was a friend of a friend situation there, but everyone else, it was like Eric Schaus at Glenkirk. I've known him forever. So when he would go anywhere, I would sub for him. And then the church that my family members go to, it's like 10 minutes away from me. And I'd played keys there a couple times before. So they knew that I was probably more available now. And they, they had me come start to sing when I could. And just, yeah, it was like connections that have, I've been in the area a long time. So I feel like I know a lot of these I don't I a lot of them used to play at my church or now they mm. work somewhere else or whatever like it's kind of a small world right and before you were on staff you were kind of touring and doing different retreats and things like that right. anyway right so you met lots of women's that retreats yeah that's the yeah. way into like <laughs> probably half of these churches it's like oh you're a female that leads worship and you play guitar decently or <laughs> piano or whatever it's like yes please come do our our women's retreat so we don't have to hire three musicians like cool yeah that's funny 
Yeah, I, that that's true. I mean, I did a ton of win, women's retreats when I was touring and stuff too. And that that is very true. There's plenty of women that can like sing, but they don't play an instrument or they don't really know how to lead. You know what I mean? So right. I There's think that's that a... trifecta. Exactly. Yeah. Your leadership. Are you comfortable talking, transitioning between songs, making those decisions in the moment, get, encouraging people to sing along, reading yep. the room. And then of course your vocals, which is very common. There's so many female singers that can kill it on vocals. And then three, I think it helps if you play an instrument. Of course, this is not everybody's calling, but for me, I play two instruments and that has opened more doors for me and more created more opportunities where the budget would only, you know, get one person there. Like if you can sing and play, you're killing two birds with one stone for those communities. Yeah. And the fact that you play guitar and piano, like it does make you more portable. Like for me, I, I, I just play piano or keys. Right. <laughs> so either they have to have a keyboard or I have to drag my keyboard, which oh, I hate yeah. doing, you know, and then I have to drag my amp and all that stuff. So you can't really do the fireside outdoor night with that. No, you really can't. <laughs> <laughs> or actually, I've done that in the past. Been like someone's like, oh, I'll bring you a keyboard. And they brought me like this crappy, like li literally a Casio keyboard, like those yeah, tiny Yeah, because it has the speakers on it. <laughs> yes. And no pedals. So I'm like, yes, no. it was awful. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, so let's go back to when we met was when you were in college. So, um, my husband's an English professor at Azusa Pacific and I decided, well, Hey, you know, I should be able to take classes for free as the wife of a faculty member. So I decided to take a songwriting class because I was working on my first album and I wanted to write some songs. And so I enrolled in this songwriting class and that's where I met Andrea and we got paired up for doing some projects together. We wrote a couple of songs together. Um, and then we just kind of kept in touch. So I'm curious after college, like how did that, and I know you released your first album while you were in college, which was, I thought was pretty impressive. So kind of what happened after that? Like, how did you, did you go straight into the worship world? Were you kind of doing, having like one foot in each place for a while? And like, then how did that lead to becoming on staff at a church? So what happened after college for me was actually a lot of um, not worship. So I was trying to not do worship. <laughs> and on a personal level, I was a Christian already at the time. I loved God. Uh, worship music wasn't as good as it is now. Like, oh, I know. I so agree. Yeah, it was it, this. We're talking. I graduated college in 2007. So I didn't like the music. I just I didn't like most of the music I was hearing. I liked gospel music. But I, I usually don't get asked to sing that <laughs> or to now I get asked to co-write it, but not back then really. I wasn't I was more of like an indie songwriter style. So after I graduated college, I had that album and I, I didn't want to do much of a, a backup plan. I was really myopically focused on touring and stuff. And so one of my friends, Tyrone Wells, told me that I should sign up for NACA, which is the college booking. Oh yes. Uh-huh thing. It's like the biggest college booking thing at the time. And I'm terrible at the business side, very unlike you, Brie. <laughs> but um, I was like, oh, sure. I, you know, he's telling me I should do it. I should, I'll do it more just to push myself and to get in front of an audience that I wasn't very comfortable. Because it was like my peer, I was barely older than them. And they seemed cooler than me. And I don't know, it's just it was a more <laughs> nervous gig. Well, I didn't even get in. So NACA West told me I was an alternate. And I was like, I should go because I already rented a booth. So we'll just trudge through these next three days, you know. Well, I get there and there's been a bunch of canceled flights and they need me as like the third alternate. Like they need me on stage that night. I had to borrow a keyboard from my roommate that I was there with, Amy Cooney, who's an incredible artist. Let me borrow her keyboard. And then I just went and played what I've been playing at coffee shops for the past couple years. And I told some jokes that I've told before. And one of the songs I played was funny. And so somehow I ended up booking like two or three tours of colleges on my first year out of college. So that's how I paid the bills was NACA bookings. So that was fun. And then the year after that, I started touring internationally through a booking agency that was sending me to Asia a lot. So I would do covers at hotels. I would do some of my own shows. I'd get to stay at the hotel for free because I was playing there. Um, so that's how I made my living you know, for the next few years. And then I got really sick. Um, so I had to stop that. And yeah, I remember after that is when we reconnected because we were both dealing with the, you know, autoimmune, autoimmune disease. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I quit touring in Asia and then 
when I started to get a little bit better, it was like 2011 by that time where I could sing again a little bit and stuff. And I was teaching to supplement income by then because less touring, more teaching. And I ended up feeling like I should start doing more worship. Like my heart had been so changed around how I saw music and how I saw my role in the world and how I saw my voice and how I saw everything that it just made more sense in my brain. It was, I was more drawn to worship leading and I wasn't really trying to make a career out of that. I was just like, let's gather in groups and sing to God, you know, like it was really, I just enjoyed it more at that time because I had, my life had slowed down. I'd entered into a really deep season of prayer and worship in my own heart during that illness just to get through it and to seek the Lord's will for my life and everything. And then, yeah, after that, I started getting asked to lead worship. It was almost like something shifted and the season changed and I started leading a lot more worship. And then I ended up on staff at a church. Were you looking for the position at the church or were you? No, I kind of fought it. I, the Lord. Ha <laughs> okay. So if you share our faith, uh, part of what we believe, and it's totally okay if you guys are all, obviously all different listeners out there, but is that God communicates to us in subtle ways and he'll like confirm it with stuff. Well, I felt like he was telling me to apply for this part-time worship leader thing at this one church that I'd been subbing at. But then I was like, no, thank you. That's not interesting to me. <laughs> it seems like I would be in an office sometimes that I'm allergic to that, you know, so I don't know. I just resisted it, resisted it. But I was also like, if you if I'm sure that you're telling me to, then I will. So let me know. And then I had this dream that just absolutely like confirmed it. I woke up from the dream. I knew what it meant and I knew I was supposed to work there. So wow. I applied that day. I was like, fine. So yeah, that was in 2012. Wow. And you worked there for 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. It, it really, it helped in so many ways. It helped me feel more connected to a local community after a season of like just being everywhere and then being nowhere because I was sick. So like I built up my sense of community and I met some lifelong friends and then um, I got better at music, better at worship, better at writing charts, better at leading teams, better at being wise with groups of people and leading a room and um, yeah, just, I don't know, a lot of mu musical um, growth, but a lot of just like personal growth too. Hmm. You know, what's interesting is the reason that I, all that time you were, were on the worship team, uh, leading worship, I was not. I mean, I was on a worship team, but I was raising kids and all that. And I was doing the entrepreneur thing and teaching online. And and then after COVID, I was just like, I need to like go out and do music. Like I have not done music at all for two years, almost, um, other than I think I sang at an online funeral. <laughs> And I oh, say wow. at one in-person funeral and I'm like, okay, if all I'm doing is funerals, that's depressing. I need, oh, to, I need to do something. So like I did it because number one, I needed to like renew my abilities. Like I hadn't been singing, I hadn't been playing. And, and I'm like, well, what better way to renew your abilities than having to do this every single week? Right. Yes. So it's actually yeah. a really a good way to I've built up my piano skills like never before doing this now for two and a half years and and singing like I don't have to practice every day because I'm singing two or three times a week when I'm rehearsing and then, you know, doing the thing. And so it, it's keeping my voice up. Did you find that that was true for you as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of the perfect way to grow as a musician. Not that that's the sole reason you should do a job like that, right. but you have to do different songs every week. You can't just repeat your set, right? Yeah. And you have, you have this day coming once a week that you are committed to. So it's like, a, it's like going to the gym and having a trainer and like the accountability of like, okay, I know that I have to practice so I can show up so I can do this. So I, let me sit at home and figure out these songs and I might as well memorize these chords so I can be more engaging. And your, your musicianship just takes off in that way, I think. And I mean, even if you serve in a different role, like let's say somebody's the drummer or the keyboard player, they're growing too. They're having to remember where the hits are and the pauses and the diamonds and dynamics and different voicings and, you know, 
if you want excellence as a church musician, I mean, a lot of these guys that end up touring with world famous pop artists, they started out playing in churches. Oh yeah. So many of like, also like the sought after Nashville, uh, you know, studio musicians yeah. honed all their skills in churches. Yeah. Right. I want to talk about just kind of like we were talking before about how working for a church can kind of expand like way beyond your regular hours. And then they're all good things, right? You know, I, I play for funerals. I play for baptisms. I do women's events and, you know, and so how did you handle that the whole time you were there with like your boundaries, making sure that you, it's so easy working in a church to get pulled into everything and then kind of expected to do it for free, even though it's not really part of your hours. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's so hard to have boundaries with some of that stuff because there's emotions involved. You're that person's leader. You're that, mm -hmm. you're the person that sang that song on that really meaningful Sunday that they had a life-changing realization or experience with God. You don't want to be the bad cop too. You don't want to be the mean mm -hmm. person. That's like, no, I can't sing at your mom's funeral. You know, like that's, it's just so hard to navigate these things with, with a tender heart, you know, but I think one important thing to look at is the culture of the church that you're involved in. Some church cultures make it easier than others to have healthy boundaries with your work and schedule and life. So if you're at a church where it's really being drilled into your head that you need to say yes to everything, that you need to sacrifice your own personal rest and, and boundaries, it's going to be harder to push against that and you're going to experience more consequences from from other people or even from leadership if you do. Now, I'm not saying that you can't say no. I mean, I was kind of in a, a few of those different seasons throughout there. It got a little um, busier and a little more intense in our church staff culture. And I was a person who was still saying like, uh, no. <laughs> and I did experience consequences from that. I got demoted one time and it was real life. I mean, these people have their priorities. And then you as an artist, you're never probably gonna fit perfectly within that system because first of all you're an artist and you're not going to fit in any system <laughs> kind of part of how it is but they have different priorities and values and expectations and they've never been a musician slash artist most of them so they're not going to understand the amount of preparation how much energy how like and how the rest of your life is operating too i mean that's just not on their radar so you have to be your own advocate mm. but if you are in a church that has understanding for that wants to see their staff members you know experience longevity instead of burnout prioritizes rest and sabbath you're gonna have an easier time expressing like hey i'm getting asked to do a funeral like once every three weeks this is taking away from my family time or my artistry time but you know that's a harder a harder thing to pitch it's a harder sell yeah yeah harder sell for church people sometimes but just that i think it's healthier for me to have some sort of situation where I'm not the only person being asked to do these memorials. Can we build a team up here and offer a solution? You know, don't just be like, hey, this is stressing me out. No, be like, hey, what if we built up a team and gave other people opportunities that are wanting to sing more and serve more or whatever the solution is for the situation. But yeah, I, I mean, maybe it's you finding a bunch of people that you could call if, if you can't yes. do it, you know, because for our church, like there really is nobody other than me that mm -hmm. could maybe one person confident like confidently do like a funeral or something like that right because we're not large you know but I need to build up my my networking and that kind of goes into the other subject that I wanted to talk about and it's like networking in the church world and you know how did you how did you find that and how do you do that in a way that is I mean, sometimes networking just feels like we're, we need, we're trying to get something for ourselves or whatever. Like we don't want to ever feel like that, especially among people in, you know, in church. So how did you handle that? I think looking back, I do have some cringe moments that I can see myself kind of getting too schmoozy, too networky. Mm. Cause I was pretty ambitious as a singer songwriter, as an artist, and just as a person, I've always just been more like of that driven type temperament. And I would bring up like, oh, well, if you need anyone for this or that, call me. And over time, I just felt like socially I was picking up on like, it just wasn't what that person was expecting from like me to say. And it didn't 
really go anywhere. What ended up having more productivity and fruitfulness around it was if you go do a really, really, really good job, then you don't have to say the schmoozy things or give people your cards as often or you know, not that we have cards anymore. We all just have phones, but like, you know, asking to have doors open for you is a little more uncomfortable than doors being opened for you because trust is built mm -hmm. and it goes unsaid. And I think there's even a Bible verse about that. Like, let other people brag on you. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to brag on yourself. Like, let other people speak highly of you. And it's kind of like, what if I put all my time and energy into making this ex experience, whether it's um, a Sunday or a worship night or a wedding or a memorial, making this experience exactly what people are hoping it will be and needing and bringing such musical excellence and wisdom and presentation that I'm memorable enough that I do come to mind when someone needs something like this again. That was a lot more fruitful for me at, in, you know, the end of the day than trying to like play at different youth groups and stuff, because honestly, most church staff people don't, they don't listen, even if you are really good. And even if you do have some awesome songs that would really benefit their youth community, they're not going to, if they don't know you, they're not going to, mm. they're not thinking like that. It's really not the same as like other parts of the music industry in that way, in my experience. Yeah, I think what I've also learned is that some people just don't value music the way we do. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, they someone may come to church every week and like see how awesome I am, but it doesn't register with them because it's just like they don't also they don't they're just not musical. So they like don't see the difference between me and whoever the last person was that was here, you know, and 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 so like for those people, you just can't you can't do more than you can do. Um, right. But there are the people that are in the church that are your huge advocates that will yes. be like telling everybody, oh, my gosh, the song she did last Sunday or blah, blah, blah. You know, and you just you just love on those people and, yeah, and they, mean, will, they get, will be your advocates. Yes, I did get really committed fans. I mean, I hate to say that word, but like followers and music community out of like being there and talking with people and singing there and people who are more interested in music being like, do you have your own music? Oh, I'm going to follow you. I want to come to your show. Like that definitely did happen too. And that's just part of any community you're in. You're going to have those super fans and those people who are interested in music. And then you're going to have the people that, that they don't realize whether you're good or not. They're not in tune. Yep, that's true. I mean, certain people just are music fans. I'm, I'm curious though, because the, so in when I kind of built my, my music career, off of a, when I was at a church in Glendora, which is a small church, but there's a lot of people there that knew a lot of people in the community. And that really helped me. That helped me get like corporate events and, and women's events and things like that. Just because of all the people in my church, I just started telling them like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm doing these performances. Like that's what I'm focused on. If you know anybody, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't like schmoozy or weird or anything. And that worked out really well for me. Um, but like at this church that I'm at now, I feel like there's plenty of people that don't even know that like I have recordings, like I have a Spotify I ha and, you know, how do you walk that line of like promoting yourself within your own church Yeah, and letting people know that like that you have other things going on? I mean, I, I think it does take a while for people to realize that you have those other dimensions like me at the new church I'm contracted at now, most of the people in that room do not know that I have music out. I've been asked that maybe twice the whole time. And I've, you know, just had in one-on-one -on -one conversation shared that with them, but I'm treading really lightly. I don't think that that's why I'm there. I think it's a different thing. Like to me nowadays, it's almost like I have to build my own path for my music and the number one thing that's going to help me do that is not my church community, but if I'm if I'm with enough conviction and dedication and excellence building this thing, then people in my church community are going to eventually organically pick up on that. But I don't think that I can build it directly by sharing it with them. If it comes up organically, I will, but I'm just really, really careful with that nowadays because I don't want to come across as having an ulterior motive or 
or talking about it to people who wouldn't gravitate towards it or, or even understand. Right. Because it's just such a different thing. You're serving a different goal when you're there, you know? It is true. And I think the way that it can happen organically is that, you know, maybe the people in your church are connecting with you on social media because they like you and, you know, and then they see, oh, look, she's got a show over here, you know, yeah, and that I kind think of thing. But you're not like putting do. it in their face. Right. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to go announce it on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're right. I mean, a lot of the people in my in my previous church community did help me musically. They they, they were like, hey, do you do um, cover songs? Do you want to play here? Do you do this? Do you want to play this festival or this mm. fair or this whatever? It, it was. But I think that's just any community. There's more entrepreneurial, creative people in that community that are going to think, hey, do you also do this? And, you know, if they're naturally a connector like that, they're going to help you out. I think that's true. I mean, that's how I got to sing the national anthem at Dodger Stadium is that people in my church were like, oh, my gosh, like you should send in a, a tape. And, you know, and then they found out there was this faith night and they'd like told me to, you know, they recommended me to do it. And that's I cool. would never have thought to do it at all without them. Yeah. So and now it's like a really nice little cherry on the top of my bio, you know, that I did that. Oh, yeah, that's very impressive. I've definitely <laughs> never done that. Oh, my gosh. Were you nervous? <laughs> Uh, yes. I mean, it's, it was like 60,000 people and you, ha you have to like sign this thing to say that you won't sing it too fast. You won't put all these embellishments in, you know, you won't change the tune like, and you have to sing it with their organist who is like this famous organist that plays at Dodger stadium. And so then you go and you get all outfitted up with the headphones and the everything and the mic and the, and the mic pack and all that stuff. And then you're, you go practice with the organist first. And then they walk you out on the field and it's like, oh, oh my, God. my gosh. Well, how's the monitoring situation? Once you're on the field, are you getting an echo? No, no, no. You, you have, you're all fitted up with headphones. So you can't okay. hear anything that's going on on the field. You can only hear you and the organist. Thank God. Right. I mean, it's, well, it's that's really helpful. a lot of decay. Yeah. I've sang in, in smaller <laughs> stadiums and it's like just me acapella. And I'm like hearing myself a second later, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, I'm singing um, for the 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 66 or San Bernardino team in a in a week, and it's something I'm doing with my church too. So it's totally relevant to what we're talking about. Nice. But I was like, well, if I sing, you know, then we can have like a church night and invite all the church members and stuff. And that's kind of another way that you can connect the church with like other things that you do is kind of make it a church event, which it worked out that way for the baseball game because it's not all about me about the right. game and how we're going to have fun but like i am going to sing the national anthem yeah and yeah but it. those That's smaller fine. stadiums i'm going to have to deal with the echo yes i know nowadays i'm like i'll just bring my iso in your monitors and just that, in, even that. though they're not plugged into anything <laughs> that would be smart <laughs> i did want to ask when you were full-time at the church like how much time did you have to work on your artist career how are you able to balance that I always told them no um, when they asked me to go full time. So I actually capped out at 29 hours mm. a week. So I stayed part time on purpose. Mm. And that was one of the things that ended up kind of when they were growing and I couldn't grow with them in that way because I was I, I didn't want to. I ended up so I was like worship director 29 hours just because that was my preference. And then when there was growth and things started picking up and they felt like they needed they really needed that point person to be like there all the time full time um which would have only added you know 10 or 11 more hours but i was already like it's already really hard to get my brain to write to promote to do any shows to collaborate like I, it was already like really tough to keep my career going so i did not want to increase my hours there and i was just like i'm sorry i really can't do that um, but I can show you how I've like made everything really efficient here. And I think, you know, I've, I'm, I'm an efficient worker in these 29 hours. Cause I know that it's full, but they ended up saying, no, you know, like they took another guy that was on the music team and made him the lead of the department because he wanted to be full time and I didn't. Mm. So then I was back to worship leader for that last little season after that. And then and a bunch of other transitions happened again. I was music director, which is like more of the band leadership stuff. 
at the, so I had four titles in those 10 years, mm. <laughs> but a lot of that was, you know, my, my decision, which is, you know, feels better than when it's someone else's decision. But I knew that saying no to full time is rare. Most people want to be transitioned from part to full time at a church. And that is their life goal and to work in ministry vocationally only. And it is a paradigm that, that not everyone saw my reasoning, but I saw my reasoning and I'm glad I stuck with my guns. Yeah. I mean, it depends if you're somebody who's the sole breadwinner for your family, you need the full-time benefits, all that stuff, you know, it makes sense to, to take that. Yeah. But if you're in a situation where you don't have to, I mean, like for me, I was able to get the salary I wanted at the church because I could say, I don't need your health insurance because I have it through my husband and, and things like that, that mm -hmm. saved them money to make it, make it possible to do the way, do it the way I wanted it and make, yeah. and basically say like, look, I'm only working these days a week, you know, because I knew I have to still be able to run this business. Like it's, it's a passion for me. It's also, obviously it brings in money and it wouldn't be worth it to say entirely goodbye to that. Yeah, another thing I'd throw out there is most churches don't pay incredibly well. Oh, they sure don't. So if you're thinking of your finances and your family in that regard, there's probably an even better solution. Mm. Like, unless you're just like, you know, some people are like, this is a perfect fit. I'm supposed to do this. But even then, it makes me nervous. It always makes me nervous when someone is putting their heart and soul and life and faith into a church job because of the volatility. Yep church jobs are notoriously volatile and yeah no our church board pastors we're the yep. ones that get the brunt of that i mean all the time you see it all the time it's true and like for us like our church board of directors changes every two years so it's like all different leadership they could have different opinions on how things should be run you know pastors come and go that kind of thing that was another reason there was just a lot of turnover and volatility on the staff I was at, I mean, we had people, it, there was a tragedy that happened and people um, passed away and it, like, it was, it was so dramatic all the time. Uh. And I know that that's actually most churches <laughs> that I just never felt comfortable going all in. I mean, and that's, mm. that's just my personality. I've always been like that. I I'm like, I'd rather have my other sources of income and diversify my income because if anything ever happens with this, then I'll just expand these other things. That's just always felt safer for me. I always want it to be like that. I love that. And I mean, that's kind of what I'm all about at Profitable Musician is that you've got to diversify because all the people that were putting all their eggs in the performing ba basket when COVID happened, they didn't have anything to fall back on. Right. You know, so you, you teach, you perform, you, you know, you're a worship leader, you're doing top lining, you, you know, you're producing for people like all those things. Then if something crazy happens like COVID, you can switch some of those things to virtual. You can, you know, you can go more in on some of the other things, but you've already started them. Like starting a new income stream is very hard, yeah. but it's ramping up one that you've already got a little bit dialed in is much easier way easier yes you already have those channels open one of the hardest things that happened to me was i actually got a voice injury oh. <laughs> i pulled a tendon oh on gosh. one side when i was singing um and it was after i had left the church job so i'm like i'm out here trying to be full-time entrepreneur like okay let's get this totally up and rolling and so i was teaching more voice and i don't know i was kind of sick that day and i don't know what happened but my voice was lopsided like this side got swollen this muscle like got tight and swollen and so my vocal cords weren't coordinating perfectly for months which would mean i could sing a little bit and then it would tire out so my like not only did my entire career change shape it then changed shape a few months later because oh. i had to reach out and see if i could play keys more and sing less at all these places and so my subbing became like a little bit more keyboard focused for a while as I recovered my voice. And that was actually really stressful. Mm. Are there any like positions at churches that are just keyboard anymore? I have a student that just recently got a gig like that. And it got me thinking like, are there many of those anymore? Or most worship leaders like multifaceted and they can do all of it. 
or, you know, maybe someone's, they just need someone to play keyboard to, for the hymns or something. Yeah, there's churches that hire like pianists that are also organists or that it can read all those hymns and classic stuff. But on the other side of the more modern churches, that, the bigger ones, a lot of times what they'll have is like a worship pastor and a music director. So two different people, music directors usually under the worship pastor, but he's, he or she is focused on playing. Maybe a lot of times it is keyboard, um, but there's an MD that's a drummer that I know too, but let's say it's keyboard. Um, so they're leading the whole band, they're playing keys, they have a talk back mic to tell everyone where to go next and stuff. They're running the tracks on Ableton or whatever. Um, that was actually my job the last year and a half that I was on staff at the church. So everything had changed and they had um, hired another a new worship pastor, my friend Emily. And so I was needed on keys more often. Like I was like singing every other week instead of every week. And then I was like playing keys. I'm like, and then the music director um, at the time transitioned off staff and then COVID hit. And I was like, dude, the writing's on the wall. Like they're not going to hire someone right now for that. Let me just do it. So the beginning of COVID, I've learned Ableton. That's what I, I like YouTube university. How do I do tracks in Ableton? Called a couple friends when I got stuck. And then, um, yeah, started becoming the music director after that. Wow. So, I mean, that's an interesting uh, perspective because I've never worked at a church that was big enough that was running tracks on Ableton. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'd go crazy. Like I, I can't, <laughs> that's why they need a, a music director or whatever that is versus the worship leader, because there's no way I could think about that while also singing and, you know, introducing the songs and, you yeah, know. The, the weeks I did sing after I became music director, I was like, the one that knew about the Ableton laptop, the one that was syncing it with the lighting and the lyrics and all the stuff. And then I would try to transition to actually being a worship leader and caring about like lyrics and what oh I was saying gosh. and playing acoustic. But I'm also listening for the tracks, but I'm also listening if the band messes up during rehearsal because I got to like, I'm the one that like, it was a lot. A nightmare. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, this has been really, really great. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, if there's any other like do's and don'ts that you want to throw out there for worship leaders or potential worship leaders or people that are in school that maybe want to be a worship leader or work at a church, what would you, what would you say to them? I'd say bloom where you're planted and start right where you're at. Mm. So if you're in a high school right now and you know that you're called to be a worshiper, start a club at lunch or in the mornings and start worshiping with people and start leading them in a couple songs and start sharing in between those songs something you feel like was highlighted to you from the Bible or a story about your faith. Start leading right where you're at. Maybe your opportunity is you volunteer at your church. Don't think of yourself as someone who's already um, should get paid when you're just starting off or when you're not as good as the other people that are getting paid. Like just be realistic, be humble do the hard work and put in the thousand hours, not just in your bedroom, but in front of people. I think that leadership, um, there's no shortcutting it. You just have to experience those moments in community and with people that love and care about this, the God that you do and, and, and that care about you and take feedback for what it is too. I think another tip is like, if something doesn't land with somebody, that's really great for me to know. And I love helpful criticism. I love feedback. I want more feedback. Like I, I never want to get defensive or shut off that feedback because that's my route to growth, you know? That's great. I love that. And that's very true. Like, I think a lot of times we expect to get paid when we're not really ready for that yet. And, and then on the reverse side, there's plenty of people that like, are totally amazing that aren't getting paid. So, you know, yeah, we, we got to even this out. Yeah. We got to, we got to know our worth too. Yeah. But I think, um, but I think you got to make sure that you're accurate with your, how your opinion of your own skills needs to be accurate before you pull that card. <laughs> yep. Yep. Obviously. Okay. So how, where can everyone find you? How can they find you on um, any social media, Spotify? Like where do you hang out? So um, on Spotify, you'll find me if you search Andrea Hamilton. And then my worship side project is called Binley. Binley is my new last name, B-I-N-L-E-Y. So on socials, you can find me at Hopeful Andrea. Or if you want to follow my worship stuff, it's at Binley Worship. And if you're interested in geeking out about the Bible with me, I have a podcast called Devotions with Dre. And you can find that at devotionswithdre.com. Yeah, and I'm going to be on the show. So I'm excited about that. Yay! <laughs>
Cool. So great to talk to you, Andrea. Thank you so much for everything that you shared. I know it's going to be really helpful to people listening to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.